Summary of How It Feels to Be Colored Me by Zora Hurston Zora Neale Hurston starts the article by saying that she is colored, or African American, and that she doesn't want to downplay that identity by claiming Native American ancestry, as some other African Americans of her time did. She can still remember the first day she knew she was black. Hurston grew up in a black town in Florida called Eatonville. Only white people on their way to Orlando were the only ones she saw. Locals didn't pay much attention to southern whites who rode through on horses, but when northern tourists went through in their cars, they made a big deal about it and would often go out on the porch to watch them. As a child, Hurston loved having these white people stop by, and she didn't try to be sneaky when she watched them from her porch. She would even meet them and walk with them as they went, and she jokes that the Chamber of Commerce should have noticed her work. Hurston says that when she was young, she didn't know the difference between white and black people. All she knew was that white people rode through her town but didn't stop. As she walked with the travelers, she would read, sing, and dance for them. She was surprised when the travelers would sometimes give her a coin. Even though the black people in her town never gave her money for her shows, she still felt at home there. When she moves to Jacksonville at age 13, she starts to see herself as a little colored girl. She talks about losing her identity. She is no longer Zora from Orange County. Instead, she is a reckless black girl who needs to be told off and kept an eye on. But in the present, Hurston doesn't think that being black is a tragedy. She talks about how she is different from other African Americans, who, she says, feel like they are being hurt by racism. Instead, she says that life is run by the strong, no matter what color of skin they have or what other factors they use. Hurston says that people tend to focus too much on the impact of slavery, which she says is 60 years in the past. She says that the problems of past generations were worth it because they gave her the freedom she has now, which she plans to use to seek glory and excitement. On the other hand, the history of slavery of African Americans haunts white people. Hurston says she doesn't always feel her race, but when she's with white people, like at Barnard College in New York, she does. But she says that the feeling is good because it makes her feel better about herself. She tells a story about taking a white friend to a jazz club in her black area. As soon as the band starts playing, Hurston falls into a dream where she can talk to her more basic, animal side. She says that her skin is painted and that she carries an African stick. But when she goes back to the real world, her white friend does nothing but praise the music. Hurston feels sorry for him because what made her so happy was just music to him. Hurston sometimes feels like she is only Zora. She doesn't belong to any one place or time. She walks around Manhattan like a figure from a story or the stars. Even though she has been treated unfairly, she can't understand why someone would turn away from her because of something as meaningless as race. Hurston uses colored bags as a metaphor for race identity and skin color to make her point. She is interested not in how the bags look, but in what's inside, which she explains in deep and moving detail. She says that all the things in these bags could be switched around and put in different bags. For example, the things in a white bag could be put in a brown bag without having to change the things inside to match the color of the bag. That may have been the original intention of the great stuffer of bags, the deity who filled the bags. About the author Zora Neale Hurston was born in Alabama in 1891, but her family moved soon after to Eatonville, Florida, where there was a strong African-American community. Hurston was passionate and strong-willed from a young age, and she often fought with her preacher father. After her mother died in 1904, Hurston joined a moving theater group to get away from the fighting in her family. She was well into her 20s before she finished high school. After that, Hurston went to Howard University and started writing and putting out her first short stories. After she moved to New York and met other well-known African-American writers and artists who were part of the Harlem Renaissance, her writing began to get attention from a wide range of people. While she was in New York, she went to Barnard College to study anthropology and made several trips to the American South to learn about African-American history and culture. Hurston's most famous books, like Their Eyes Were Watching God, came out in the 1930s and 1940s, 
but she never made as much money or got as much attention as she should have. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.